Hello and welcome viewers and panelists to our uh, uh, session on enabling small cells. This is a very pertinent topic uh, with the 5G rollout that how do you enable next generation of small cell solutions? Uh, we are going to take a look today uh, how the telecom sector is evolving, how the architecture is shifting and with the advent of all the 5G applications, the ORAN architecture, where are small cells playing a role? How can they be deployed in a wider uh, fashion? And then um, what are some of the challenges, opportunities, solutions that are available? Uh, I have two uh, industry experts uh, as part of the panel here. I have Bim Raut from NXP and Ashish Pansil from Lattice. I would invite our panelists to introduce themselves. But before we go there, a little logistical thing. There is a widget where you can type your questions. So please make use of it, type your questions. We will address a few of those questions time permitting. And if we cannot get to all of them during this panel, um, we will definitely use your contact information with us and respond to you individually with answers. So welcome again to Lattice's Developer Conference Small Cell Session. And I would like uh, to invite Wim to introduce himself and then Ashish, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Manta, for, uh, for having me, for having us here. Uh, you're right, it's a very pertinent topic. Um, so little background, uh, my name is Wim Bouvet. I'm a systems architect. Uh, my legacy is from Motorola, Freescale, and then NXP Semiconductor. And we've been working uh, primarily in the infrastructure in the 5G space uh, for a couple of decades, uh, both on the, the DSP modem side, as well as the, uh, the host processor side, the stack side of the solution. And uh, you wouldn't be surprised to know that we have some products uh, active in the small cell space today. Thank you. Ashish? Thanks, Mamta. Yeah, uh, I'm Ashish Mansala. Just a little bit uh, background about myself. I've been working the last two decades in architecting, implementing, and working on different generation of wireless networks. The world has ever seen so far. A lot of innovation. Most recently, I was actually working on the 5G ORN uh, architecture network, which was deployed in the uh, US. Uh, I have also been involved in uh, different standard bodies like ORN, TIP, 3GPP, and other regulatory bodies. Today, actually, this is a very important topic, how where 5G is going and what uh, what is the next chapter for 5G. And I look forward for this exciting discussion with the other esteemed panelists today. So over to you, Mamta. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to have you both. And thank you for taking the time to be on the panel. So I'll kick this off uh, asking uh, both of you to give a little bit of an overview of the 5G promise. What is it enabling? And then how do small cells play into realizing this promise of 5G? I'll start with you, Ashish. Yeah, so uh, 5G, as we know, is a very popular, most popular actually than any other wireless technology. It's a very popular term which is used in any household around the world, right? Let me start with uh, giving a quick glance of where 5G uh, deployment status is around the world and to understand where we are now and where we are heading for the next few years, right? So globally, as we know, there's some uh, uh, like uh, current status where the 5G is on uh, mid-band is covering like around 30% of the US uh, actually worldwide population. And uh, it's set uh, uh, to reach around 35%, 40% end of uh, this year. We are working on some of the new developments of 5G network in some certain geographies. Like uh, in India, they announced a major 5G a deployment which is happening as we speak to cover 1.3 billion people that's supposed to uh, finish in 2025 2026 time frame uh, we got some new announcements coming from uh, europe uh, where they're going to build out the networks and more modernize the network and uh, do that the uh, oran way and uh, so that's what has been happening uh, uh, for the last couple of years Let's see what has been the first. So, so it's very important for us to understand what's happened in the first phase of the 5G journey, which the telcos have actually laid the foundation of their networks and provide the 5G basic connectivity service. So, I mean, even though this approach works well with mobile phones, but users can still be 
connected with internet and get the better throughput than what they saw in 4G. So that's what actually happened so far. What this approach does not really provide is what real 5G experience of ultra low latency and super high bandwidth, which is an, which has been a promise of uh, 5G. We don't get a very personalized user experience based on the requirements from the end devices, which could be connected car as an example, or a smart industry. That's where the next phase of 5G journey and implementation is going to be super critical and will help to provide advanced 5G services uh, to realize um, uh, the additional use cases, which has been like EMBB, or LLC, and MMTC. This, will, uh, this phase will also see the expansion uh, to the other 65% of the population, which is still unconnected uh, for the 5G. And both of this phase, uh, both of this phase <coughs> cover uh, the additional use cases of autonomous driving, smart factories, machines, smart cities, and so all the other medical robotic surgery use cases as well uh, and to provide the 5G guaranteed services to the end user. So I'd like to summarize here that the next three, four years is going to be very busy time for 5G expansion around the world, providing five advanced 5G networks capabilities to the end user. No, that's, that's a great overview of the 5G rollout and where we stand. So when, uh, let's let's now address the promise of 5G and how small cells uh, play into it. Uh, it's a big one, <laughs> and, and there, there's a lot to unpack there. So I think, you know, first of all, to, to echo uh, what Ashish is saying, right? Like um, 5G uh, initially, up till now, what you you and I as a consumer experience is what's called EMBB, which is in many ways just a continuation of the mobile phone journey. Right, more gigabits per second or megabits per second to your mobile phone. And you know, that aspect is up till now, not fully, but largely controlled by the big OEMs uh, with some sporadic ORAM uh, presence in there, uh, showing success, showing promise. Um, but th that journey itself will continue to evolve because you know the, the whole world's population is not covered with 5g yet so that, that that's one piece and that will continue however um if you look at the the previous g's you know two three four g we we went from voice to data to internet to the phone and if you look at 5g the, the promise of 5g is that it connects everything anywhere right that's kind of like the the goal where, as Ashish put it, right, that's your LLC, industrial, that's machine, uh, massive machine type communication, you know, that's the 3 gpp terminology. But what that really boils down to is the flexibility in the, in the 5G standard, you know, uh, flexible waveform, flexible numerology, very low bandwidth, very high bandwidth. And, you know, that is the promise of 5G, and that goes way beyond what, uh, you know, communication to the mobile phone uh, is. Now, to your question, <laughs> um, uh, where do the small cells come in here? And I think first, let's talk about that mobile phone. So if you look at that from a physics perspective, you know, spectral uh, allocation, the bulk of the spectral allocation in 5G today is the 3.x gigahertz range uh, around the globe, right? And there's there's auto deployments. It's not you. The 3GPP allows you anything between 400 megahertz and many gigahertz. Um, but in the low band, that's three and a half gigahertz. In the high band, you know, 28, 39 gigahertz, 24, 26, 28, 39 gigahertz. And just from physics, you know that small cells, let's say, need to be deployed to cover at that spectrum indoor penetration and a high throughput scenario to a mobile phone. It's very difficult to cover a 10 kilometer range at three and a half gigahertz through, you know, triple glazing and, you know, other, uh, other difficult to penetrate materials. So just fulfilling the mobile phone promise implies the user small cell, especially if we take a little bit of a creative definition of what this small cell is. And, it's probably something we should talk about later. Um, so I, I will say that, you know, just again, like just to make the, the gigabit to the mobile phone work, 
you will end up with small cells one way or the other. And, you know, as more and more people get on the network and that is continuing to increase, um, there you go. Now, why did I mention those different use cases is that if you look at the industrial use case or if you look at, you know, uh, any other indoor application that requires positioning or think anything that, that 5G promises, AR, VR and so on, um, they, uh, they will naturally rely on small cells as well because they're much, they're much closer to the human being or to the robot. They're indoor, et cetera, et cetera. And those are just very natural use cases of small cell um, in, in that regard. So we have, I think, both the, the spectral aspect and the deployment use case aspect that uh, that will drive small cell deployment. But but keep in mind, this is a, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. So um, even though everything you know, everything great about Fair G was being promised since 2019, 2020, uh, there's, there's still a ways to go. We're not done yet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, from all the nuggets that you guys have um, given out in this section, one thing that really stuck that, first of all, the journey is still in its, uh, I would say, first half of deployment of 5G. And the other is it needs to go beyond mobile. And then there is some physics into it. Now, in the green room, we were talking about that. Is this something to do with line of sight communication that 5G brings in? And uh, if you have a building or a mountain in front of it, oh, you need something to densify the coverage. Wim, you want to take that? You know, um, yeah. very technical term, densify. So, but. No, absolutely. I think um, I probably should have touched on that. I think the you, you mentioned two things, right? Uh, uh, the, the line of sight, i.e. penetration loss. If you take, for example, millimeter wave communication, um, millimeter waves don't go through a mountain um, and they, they don't go over it either. So, uh, in fact, it's a street corner that is difficult to cross. So if you're going to deploy a downtown uh, Austin, where I'm located, uh, with millimeter wave, and, and there's deployment maps that are publicly visible on the internet for this, you will see essentially a small cell in every street corner. Um, so that that's one aspect. Um, density is the other one. Um, the observation at the tail end of LTE deployment was that in very busy areas, you know, uh, Shanghai, New York, Tokyo, uh, you will see that, uh, that we're reaching an LTE language maximum density of deployment. So now you're talking about, you know, megabits per second per square kilometer. And, you know, the requirement there is defined by the amount of human beings and how many megabits each human being consumes. And, you know, how do you solve that equation? Um, you solve that by um, allocating more bandwidth, which 5G conveniently does, three and a half gigahertz millimeter wave, uh, as well as enhancing the standard to do you know, fancy new things, single frequency networks, and clever use of the spectrum that you have available. Passive MIMO is, is one example there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that was very educational and uh, interesting to build up our, um, you know, next set of questions or talking points. So uh, now we know the landscape of 5G deployment and uh, kind of sort of where for small cells fit in there. So there are so many terms floating around when um, people talk about small cells, macro, pico, micro. So could you experts educate our viewers? What are the different kind of small cells? Where do you know various things get deployed? And uh, you know what? What are the considerations uh, into deploying these? What applications they go into? So let's talk about the small cell uh, you know solutions or configurations that are available and what do they mean that's a big one as well <laughs> i'll have a stab at and you can chase me down as she um so i think there's two ways to uh, look at the definition of what is a small cell and i think it's uh, you're hitting on a good topic again you know it's uh, it's important to define we're talking about 
I think, first of all, if you look at the 3GPP standard, um, I think it's 38.141 or whatever the number may be, um, it defines a wide area network, medium area network, and local area network. And those are, by and large, defined by the output power of the base station. 24 dBm for the local, 38 for the medium area, and above 38 for wide area. So in 3GP language, you could say, you know, medium and local is small set. Why not? Um, and on top of that, you have the definition that is, um, let's call it the marketing definition. Um, and being marketing, that's a lot more fluid, right? You, you call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, so in comes macro, micro, pico, femto, nano, uh, atto, whatever you wish. And um, again, th those terms are, I don't think, to my knowledge at least, they're not formally defined. What you typically see is, you know, macro is like thousands or thousands of, of users uh, with hundreds at least active at a time. Um, and uh, nano, femto, let's say femto is the most commonly one on the other side of the spectrum is your in-home, you know, coverage extension. You know, if you don't have no bars in your house, which is typically, you know, let's say eight users, right? Your family and a couple of friends. Um, where you then see commonly used term is, is Pico is somewhere in the middle. That's your coffee shop type of deployment, 64 users. Now mapping that to 3GPP and that marketing term, you can kind of see that that Femto area, 24 dBm, um, you see the Pico area slightly higher than that. And then uh, the micro area, you know, your neighborhood small cell, parking garage, uh, stadium venue, you know, something like that maps to that medium area and 3GPP lingo. But, um, but again, th these are very fluid terms. And uh, I think they, they allow the vendors to put it the, the terminology on the box that they want to put on the box, <laughs> whatever sounds most impressive. Yeah, and um, so that that was great. Uh, could you also shed some light on uh, the design considerations or component considerations, price sensitivity, power sensitivity? And say, what are those considerations when um, our developers are designing for a Femto or a Pico? This is, after all, that this is developers conference. A lot of yeah. developers are tuning in. So, what would what would they consider, and what what do they uh, look out for for these various gradations uh, in terms of uh, various uh, you know design considerations? That's a good one. The, I think the without oversimplifying it, let's start by saying that the the fun tool one is. Uh, uh, the, the easiest one and uh, easy comes with an asterisk there of course um, but in that space you're talking about uh, 24 dBm uh, or 20 24 dBm output power at the antenna and in, in the end the RF defines everything um, so the, that output power with the antenna current gives you a throughput on, on what you're going to get in the DSP complexity of the algorithms you know mobility in home you're not going to necessarily walk around at 100 miles an hour um, and you know it gives you performance capability in terms of numbers of users scheduler complexity whatever at the host processor but uh, but the RF piece is really key here um, 3GPP de defines um, spectral emission mask uh, receiver sensitivity and with that the RF design complexity uh, which defines the RF transceiver, the front end, the circulators, filters. Um, and then from there on, it defines the, the digital complexity to compensate for all the inaccuracies on the RF side. And what you find is that in the very low end, you know, the, the Femto in-home uh, side of the equation, that RF complexity is well understood. The designs are not overly complex. And... The, that's good news because the cost target is extremely aggressive, right? Consumer equipment uh, comes at a consumer price. And if an operator puts it into your home free of charges, it has to be even more aggressive than the consumer price would be. What you I do see. find is that as you go above that consumer grade, um, so into uh, enterprise, coffee shop, 
or that 38 dBm medium area network. Now you're dealing with a completely uh, different level of complexity, right? Because now you absolutely will not afford a service outage or mm -hmm. loss in coverage or a reduction in cell edge performance or all the things that you might give up on on the consumer space. And the RF design complexity is much higher. Um, yeah. If you start looking at the capability to uh, to be part of a uh, of a wider operator deploy network, how you deal with uh, blocker performance, interference, uh, spectral emission mass, and dealing with uh, power, you know, five watt, ten watt power amplifier, is a beast to handle. Um, so that those complexities comes in uh, at the same time because. Fewer of those are deployed and are typically deployed by an operator in a, in a managed way. Um, there is there is cost sensitivity, but it's less cost sensitive than uh, than the mm. consumer space. I see. Yeah. Yeah, Shisha, what's your take there? Yeah, so so I agree uh, uh, to what Wim mentioned. Actually, a lot of good points are covered, and especially around uh, RF efficiencies and RF performance and some of the three GPP specs. I'll just like to add, right? I think. <coughs> As we have been discussing uh, the next phase of 5G journey where small cells are going to be deployed in massive, right? Big volume around the world. What's more, what's going to be a you know very critical factor for designing the 5G uh, small cells? And what's going to be very appealing for the, you know, like operators or enterprises to deploy these uh, uh, attractive, to make it attractive. I think what Wim talked about is the cost. Uh, there's another uh, consideration which he talked about, and I'd like to just reiterate on that, which is uh, the power efficiency. So power efficiency for the next generation solution designs have to innovate. I mean, they have to be very innovative uh, with the uh, lower power. And that's that's a very critical fact. As a matter of fact, we know, right, telco's um, uh, operation of the RAN site infrastructure, that that consumes maximum amount of that, what their operating budget is. So we know that this next generation solutions has to be built on not just driving down the low power, but there's other surrounding cost. Like if you have the lower power and lower heat dissipation in the overall device, then you also lower down on the other supplemental like cooling cost, mechanical cost, other thermals and so on. Not just that, uh, as we uh, go into the next phase of 5G journey with the small cells, uh, and these are in masses, which we talked about uh, to provide that 5G densification and 5G advanced networks. These solutions needs to be very cost effective uh, in order to be deployed in volume, right? So that's where I think I'll just like to mention those two factors for the next gen uh, for the design of the uh, the small cells uh, as we as we go further. Yeah, Ashish, I quickly want to echo what you said that the power efficiency is key here. And you know, especially if you look at it slightly above consumer space, you know, if you have a you know 20 watt, 40 watt power amplifier, the at a 50 percent more or less efficiency point, that means you're consuming the overall box is going to consume 100 watts DC. So, if in that type of a space, if you can spend in terms of digital logic um like one or two watts five watts more in processing power this is okay if you can gain much more in efficiency at the power amplifier at a system level so your whole design trade-offs in that space uh are maybe even counterintuitive right it, it's sometimes okay to spend more design complexity mm -hmm. in order to achieve an overall system power gain and that, that equation is really interesting for, for guys like us that are you know, drawing the block diagrams of those systems and going through that analysis. So thanks for highlighting that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's important, right? I think we are trying to uh, work on something really cool, which is needed in the future. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we need to... Turn, intended. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, we need to We need to turn the telcos, we need to turn the environment more green, right? So the best designs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, absolutely, um, you know, very pertinent points. Uh, green telecom is is becoming a huge concern, not only just a buzzword. Everybody is looking for low power solution. 
But then quality of services is still the oxygen of this thing. You cannot compromise on quality of service, but you need to give coverage. You need to give, uh, you know, performance. You need to give all that and then keep the power down, cost down. So it's always that uh, balance that we have to do. So great um, points. And uh, now let's continue our journey. And so we see the opportunity. We see the evolution of the market. Uh, Ashish, how does Oran play into small cell market? I see that sudden buzz, uh, you know, and chatter going up with and and Oran and small cells being talked about, you know, together a lot. 5G small cell, we now understand why they are talked together and the promise of 5G and how small cells can help in, uh, you know, fulfilling that promise. But how does Oran and small cell play together? Yeah, and good question and good timing, as I think we are largely seeing around the word maturity of, of ORAN networks, a lot of trials, a lot of success, actually deployment, the real field deployments happening in the ORAN. So I don't want to be repetitive about the benefits of ORAN and why it's one of the biggest disruptors, which I believe of all times for the wireless technology. I, I, I don't think we have ever gone through this buzz before about uh, you know, any kind of a technological revolution, uh, evolutions which happen in the wireless, right? So as the name implies, ORAN is all about openness and bringing best and breed innovative solutions, which we all know. Now we are changing the definition of how the networks could be deployed. Open RAN is actually going to expand on different kind of, so we, we talk about open RAN, but we talk about different kind of a splits, which are used by the small cells and some of the earlier deployments, which we are we were talking about either in the femto space, micro, small cell, pico, and so on. Open RAN is actually going to expand on different kind of a split used by small cells. Similar to macro, like where you have the ORAN Alliance has been working on the standardization, uh, the specifications of the option 7.2x split, where RU is one RU, um, one vendor RU is connected to different vendors, DU and CU system, and then communicating to, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, the network itself. In another example, if you could have a similar deployment where you can have a 7.2 small cell, and that way you can uh, use the same benefit of a small cell. Uh, one small cell are you connected to uh, a node or centralized BPU either in the in the in the building in the stadium uh, there could be different use cases and another example I think that's that's going to be a big uh, kind of a use case which what I personally see in the very near future especially the street uh, local area kind of a network medium area network use cases which Vim talk about is all integrated small cell, which is all in one in small cell where we collapse uh, CU, DU, RU functionality as uh, into one box to serve a very limited area to provide those spectral efficiency gains to provide that desired quality to serve not just the man's but the machines, you know, which also need the 5G connectivity, right? So you could have other options because 3GPP talks about many different options uh, like option eight and option six. Some of these options like uh, even are not possible uh, for the macro deployments. And with, with small cells based on the use case where you want to uh, divide your, or you know, put a logical partition on your RAN stack, layer one, layer two, layer three, you can just come up with a perfect uh, uh, solution right for to serve that specific uh, you know use case it's all based on the, your design consideration what you have to design this for and then of course working on backwards to your space power mechanical and so on so it's going to be a very uh, kind of a different deployment model we are already the doors have been opened by the 3gpp doors have been opened by oran uh, for a small cells to come forward and being deployed in different kind of a topology. And I'll let maybe Vim add a little bit more color to this. <laughs> um, no, I think you're right. Let, let me let me try and bring a completely different angle into it. I'm not uh, to add on top of where you're, you're at. So you're correct in that, you know, if you if you break it down to the fundamental, what ORAN does, it, it defines a set of you know, front hall, mid hall, back hall interfaces in a standardized way, allowing a mix and match across vendors. 
right? And that silicon families, software families, hardware families, um, uh, system families. Um, and you're correct in, in that 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 allows creative, if you wish, deployment methods uh, around city in, uh, in support of EMB and other use cases. Uh, but I want to echo back a little bit also where I was at the beginning that 5G is about providing a variety in use cases. It's not just about connecting more megabits per second to your mobile phone. And what we are starting to see is that um, in those use cases, you have, um, they, they are well less well defined. And as such, there is a, a bigger spectrum of smaller, more diverse um, uh, folk operating in those markets. And those use cases and, and those vendors are very much helped by standardized interfaces, which allows them to uh, use off the shelf components, hardware and software. So if I want to build as a system vendor, for example, um, if I want to build an industrial network that has a specific reliability constraint or a unique way of operating in the spectrum, whatever, then I don't necessarily need to build a system from scratch anymore, but I can start plugging together components that are on the market using those open interfaces and focus on my area of expertise and quickly come to market with a system. I think in, in that regard, and you said it, it's, it's it's ORAN, it's 3GPP, and you know, for 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 the older people amongst us like me, you know, the the Femto APIs come in there. Um, it's that type of standardization that um, that allows use case diversification in the end. Um, it doesn't take away from your point. I think it's it's and and there, and and that's why let's say the ORAN community is a good one to have, uh, and we can start seeing this come to market now. Um, you know, the, the, the use cases beyond the, you know, look at works uh, base stage, if you wish. Yeah, I, I so that's, that's uh, I fully agree because I think what we may actually introduce another very important point. So we have been talking about um, ecosystem, I mean, the power and cost, but the ecosystem diversity and the openness, I think those are the key drivers, uh, uh, which is going to, you know, like bring up different Kind of interactions, different user experience, which is needed, Cust very customized user experience uh, needed by not just the users. And I, I keep on saying the machine word. It's actually the man and the machine which gets served by five G smalls. Yeah, and um, you know, as a receiver of all this information and a consumer of all this information, I could see where small cells could actually help solve that problem of customization because. Almost, if you are going beyond the mobile with 5G, uh, and you get into these specialized applications, you may want a little specialized network also that is, you know, fulfilling your requirements. So it's very hard, I would imagine, to do a even a man level uh, MAN, not you know, um, not gender, but MAN, the <laughs> the middle size network that you introduced, or the metro size network it will be very hard to customize it for a robotic surgery or something. But if you have a small cell, I believe it's much easier to uh, customize the APIs, customize the bandwidth or the exactly. QoS parameters. Yeah, uh, exactly. Correct, yeah. yeah I'll no, give you a random example. We've got customers in the oil and gas industry that are using some crazy spectrum that nobody thought they would be using and have some very unique deployment considerations. And, you know, it's specialized, it's small, but it's enabled by ORAN because the vendors in that ecosystem are simply not uh, sized to build, you know, antenna to Ethernet, everything from scratch, right? This is where the teaming up uh, comes into play. It's a good thing. You know, yeah, uh, it, it sparks creativity, if you wish. Yeah, so then we see the synergy between uh, the open, varied, specialized, infrastructure components and small cell providing the you know mode of uh, connection or, or mode of communication and then all play together to build very specialized uh, 
applications and delivering that 5G promise we talked about earlier. So, uh, okay, I think we are very well positioned now. We understand how 5G and small cell goes, go together, why that does. We also understand, uh, you know, 5G and ORAN, why they make sense together. Now let's talk about challenges. You know, uh, now that the tel telco operators would be, um, you know, deploying small cells, developers who are listening in, our customers who are listening in would be keen to know what to look ahead, what has industry already faced, what problems are designers facing. So I would like to now focus our attention on the challenges and uh, how are these problems being uh, solved. Ashish, you want to kick us off there? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mamta. So, yeah, I mean, let's keep aside like, uh, you know, the challenges. I think we talk about challenges for the telecom operators. Let's keep aside the monetization and ROI discussion, which I think everybody's talking about, right? But the telcos, they need to make more money. I, I'll focus my comments on real challenges for the technical community, right? And uh, the, the design challenges they face. We touched upon the openness of these interfaces. We talked about the openness of these solutions earlier. If you look into the earlier generation networks, right, they were pretty much like black box. So they were not giving expo any exposure uh, to, you know, make the customization flexibility or to provide the desired, you know, user centric services. I think one of the challenge which I see, and of course, uh, you know, community, what we discussed earlier, ORAN community or open RAN community is already working on is defining that openness of the interfaces, openness of this network topology, how the RU, how, you, how the DU, CU gets deployed and what can, and then the Mac aspect of it. I think it's very important for, for, the, for the innovation to happen. And that's what, right, I think we call, keep on talking about AI ML. Uh, it's very important for customization and for the developers to reach out and go and program any certain network function as required to meet their desired user experience or quality of service. And the best case scenario would be like if they have a computer vision application, if they have to do some kind of inference detection right at the edge where some of these small cells are deployed, that is going to be saving them a lot of troubleshooting, is going to automate and that's the complexity of amount of small cells, the so many moving parts. I think that is the innovation we need to see uh, in this arena of 5G small cells deployment. But I'm glad that some of that is already overcome as we speak. So as you mentioned this, as, as people are gaining their, you know, gaining the feel of this uh, technical challenge, um, do you guys see we have enough depth in ecosystem to support uh, all of, you know, solving these challenges or this kind of uh, uh, technical advance that Ashish talked about, um, Avim? I, I think the key point there is to keep in mind that, you know, all the PowerPoint and various marketing claims aside, I think the reality on the ground, you know, where, where we spend most of our time is that small cells are, you know, functional, compliant, you know, high-performance small cells are coming to the market now. Uh, you know, a couple of months earlier, later, fair enough, but it's it's in many regards i'd say early days and i think um in to ashish's point i think it is very easy to understand how for example ai ml can do a great job in network organization network management right um it's intuitive uh, and that's a good thing but um but it's early days <laughs> so um, I know, Ashish, what, what's your take there? Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I think we are opening uh, some of that, but uh, but yeah, we still have a long road for us. So uh, so I fully I think uh, we still have to walk through some of these challenges uh, to solve this. So make it more uh, kind of open, real open uh, uh, in networks, open programmable networks, right? At the small cells. So. Okay, so we just touched upon the infrastructure level or system level innovation that needs to happen and deepening of the ecosystem. Now, what about the application side of thing? I'm saying 
ultimately small cell is another way of communication. So what do you do with it? So when we talked about the promise of 5G and how small cells are going to complete the picture, so what is happening on the application development side of things? Uh, how's the market shaping up there? How's the uh, technical landscape shaping up there? I, th yeah. I think it's coming. Um, the it's it's that next layer, right? So the the expectation in 5G, as it was projected a few years ago, and what you start seeing echoed now in the requirements even towards you know 6G is the flexibility the application level it's no longer purely about the network um and you know how many gigabits can i get to to the widget rather than can i do something useful or fun with it you know what am i going to do with it rather than just defining it that, that's the application challenge and i think uh, a month, I think you're going to like hearing this term. This is where the word flexibility kicks in. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, right? We're working with a couple of customers on the, the topic of uh, joint communication and sensing, right? So what's the idea is that the small cell uh, knows where the user is or the user knows where he or she is. Um, and with that information alone, you know, indoor, uh, anywhere, you can do a lot of useful stuff, right? I can send you a targeted reminder um, uh, to go to the, to the other side of the cafeteria if there's something special on offer or, you know, whatever. And in order to do that, you know, the, 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 I think if enough creative people get together, they will come with application that, that, that the three of us would never imagine. Um, but this is, driving into engineering requirements at a very low level. You know, positioning requires uh, special math to be applied to IQ samples in the baseband. Now, who's going to do that? Where's that interface? Which hardware widget is going to take care of that? Where does that hardware widget sit in the system? Um, so I think this is, uh, this is the exciting piece. And this is where, you know, uh, uh, where I, I'm looking forward um, to new things happening. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, th thanks, Finn. And uh, actually, uh, this brings up a good point, right? I think what we have been seeing largely around the world with the ecosystem development, right? We talk about the, the programmable networks, we talk about the software defined network and so on. So as we realize, right, that in uh, software IT, uh, the, the reason they, they were making it more, you know, open is uh, they wanted to be flexible. Right. And now we are looking at this uh, in telecom infrastructure. We are looking at this infrastructure, which is evolving. We also need a flexibility on the hardware level. We also need that flex, uh, same flexibility, the programmability aspects. And that story actually is uh, never complete without FPGAs in picture. So that's, and that's why we have been smiling for the last five minutes since he said flexibility because <laughs> you say flexibility, <laughs> I say FPGA, yeah. <laughs> you say low power, I say lattice. So, you know, uh, we are an FPGA company. It's a shameless plug, but you know what? It's a lattice developers conference. So we are all good and friends here. Hey, you need a processor as well. That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Let's shake hands. <laughs> Um, no, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, very good points. And I, I just keep looking at it. You know, business development is my day job. So that's what my job is in security, telecom and data center BUs. Um, you know, the one I lead is, and I see it all the time where customers are trying to solve problems and they have something they can take 80, 90, 95% of what is offered in general. Either it's a network spec or is it a, you know, a CPU spec or is it a SOC on the market that they can take and use. But there's always that element of little thing that is missing that has to be customized for their application or the standard has moved just enough that now they are no longer compliant or they're basic enough. And that's where we see the demand for flexibility in almost each and every application, uh, you know, critical application that we target. And their FPGAs become very important. 
And apart from FPGAs, I'm saying small cell almost, again, I'll, I'll repeat my point here, uh, from coming from a massive network where it's in the broadcast mode, you take it, what you get, the performance, uh, QS numbers, there's a small cell that you can configure, that you can manage according to your needs, I think is very powerful. And uh, of course, uh, as the needs change, couple it, you know, with uh, other technologies and you have a very custom made solution for your application. So uh, let's move on. Uh, when we talk about challenges, we always talk about solutions. So challenges are opportunities, all the rah, rah, rah that we did in our business courses. So what are, uh, you know, the solutions that are being, that are coming to the market for the challenges that you folks mentioned. So if you could just uh, talk about those and, uh, you know, how are people using various technologies to solve them? Is that uh, a question for Wim or uh, me? Yeah, Wim, Wim could start. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about anything you want. So I think, <laughs> I think the word flexibility has been mentioned five times, so I'm going to go with flexibility as, uh, uh, as both the challenge and the solution, right? The, the market wants more than just me megabits to the phone. There's your challenge. And uh, besides the hardware, you know, the solution as provided by, you know, 3GPP or the wireless industry, um, they, uh, that industry provides a solution that for, for, People that have been in there like us for the last 20 years is is the always the same one it all starts with spectrum and uh, some of the exciting areas there are is what is happening in uh, cbrs spectrum in the us the private network bands in europe um, the capabilities that may or may not have been explored fully yet in millimeter wave and you know it's all it all starts and ends with the spectrum in this industry Hmm. So, uh, I'm I'm excited to see what happens, um, not only in the traditional you know managed macro network operation, um, but in in how that that newly allocated spectrum gets used in in creative ways. Uh, that that's where the flexibility work kicks in again and again and again, and that's where the new applications are being targeted. Yeah. And I, I want to, I just like to add, right? I want to uh, uh, repeat the flexibility word, even though it's very <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think we have been also discussing a lot about the power efficiency, security, right? And that thing, another one of the big uh, phenomena happening worldwide about the security, additional security uh, by the nature of the disaggregation, moving pads, we are increasing the attack surface. And then, of course, reliability of some are going to be very imperative for these solutions, right? You have to have the, them some some part, you know, critical part of the overall design. So a little bit pitch about Lattice. So Lattice FPGA, of course, uh, you know, has a portfolio with the right amount of compute and um, third speeds and logical cells and, you know, uh, different kind of capabilities. Uh, roadmap is very enriched. To, to serve as a sweet spot for some of these designs. So uh, the solutions can actually leverage. We have a leadership, Lattice as a leadership in the low power space, a small size, a small size, sorry. Uh, so it's very important. I think we have been discussing that this next generation of small cells has to be designed at the optimal level with embedded security as one of the core kind of a backbone to it, right? So uh, then that's going to be a big boost, uh, you, you know, using um, using some of these designs using the lattice FPG. Thank you. And as you guys were getting a little self-conscious about using the word flexible again and again and again, <laughs> let me give you some synonyms: moldability, malleability, elasticity, pliancy, suppleness. You know, we can we can we can apply all of these words to flexibility and then cover the same topics. So. Um, yeah, let's keep going on. We have we are uh, at a very great clip, and I think um, you know we have educated our viewers. Uh, what's what's really unique about this five uh, G small cell development deployment? Um, you know, we we talked about the architecture, we talked about the challenges. Something unique about uh, the band it plays in. So Vim kind of touched upon it. 
Uh, but let's delve down a little deeper. Ashish, you may want to start us uh, up with there. What's happening in various geographies? Uh, yeah. are, are, you know, are various areas adopting small cells? Is it more for urban, rural? Those kind of things are coming to my mind that, okay, where is it being deployed apart from applications, which is still more of a conceptual phase, but from how about hard geographies, um, various countries or, uh, and then all about the spectrum and allocation of spectrum. There was so much brouhaha about it. Does small cell um, arena get impacted by that? So yeah, great, great question and actually very interesting. So we, we know that a small cell ha world has been there, right? Even in the earliest generation of networks, right? We talked about small cell, 4G, 3G, a little bit on 3G. And uh, where a small cell is actually getting, I can be more excited right now with the 5G chapter, where a small cell is actually going to kick in and be uh, kind of a main drivers of the 5G deployment, which we talked about earlier, right? So we know... Um, as a matter of fact, many geographies like uh, North America, US, Europe, so they have released a lot of unlicensed spectrum uh, for you know general purpose, uh, like what we call general purpose hardware, general purpose spectrum, which can be used without any license. So other than what we were bottlenecked earlier by uh, by the telcos deploying uh, you know the small cells or the telco infrastructure. We have a tremendous opportunity ahead of us where private players, private networks, enterprises, mines, dockyards, shipyards, and you know, I mean, different kind of uh, small campuses, mid campuses, uh, uh, public safety, they can deploy their own network using these small cells. And then not just that, right? It's very important. We talked about flexibility, openness, but uh, any network, say if enterprise or mines, they deploy their own network, they, uh, because of this openness of the interfaces, the open RAN architecture itself, the flexibility uh, of how they can deploy, they can program their networks based on what they need right at the edge. So the, we, they, to solve their individual challenges, to solve their individual problems and well, the, to provide the desired kind of a services uh, to the end user. So we are going to see a big boost of the network, 5G network in the, uh, in, um, uh, in the near future. Uh, and this similarly, we, uh, other than North America or US, I think Europe and Asia, they have their own share of uh, unlicensed spectrum. And that will add additional kind of a you know, boost for uh, uh, deployment and expansion of 5G services around the world. Wim, maybe you'd like to add something? <laughs> Little to add to what you say, I think um, an interesting use case that we came across recently is uh, railways. Uh, you know, trains need to be connected as well. Uh, uh, Non-terrestrial networks, you know, that's a very big buzzword these days. Uh, that, and that there's a whole set of challenges comes with that. And, you know, evolution of, of IoT space, right? Um, um, IoT is, is, a, is a big wave of innovation. And again, it, it ties into, you know, uh, not everything is the same. Um, malleability, that's the word I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to stick with that one. Absolutely. Thank you, folks. Um, we are fast coming up to the end of our session. Ashish, you want to tell us a little about the small cell project that you mentioned Lattice is working on, a brief overview of that? Yeah, I love to do that, right? I can be more excited. So yes, <laughs> this is where uh, we've been talking about uh, the, you know, like where FPGAs come into play. But uh, let me give you a little bit preview of what Lattice has been working also on the ORAN solution. So of course we have our silicon and semiconductor, but what we are building is actually on top of it, like a stack, a solution stack uh, for faster time to market and to enable, you know, uh, for the developers and, uh, uh, the development and then um, delivery or you know go to market for the end product right so where we started last year 2022 we introduced our first secure the wire stack which is secure the wire or like pci uh, within the box the second um and I'll, I'll just rush right i think because of the limitation in time and we'll provide uh, other references to refer to those materials but then uh, the earlier part of this year, which is 2023, during the MWC Barcelona, we introduced our 1588 PTP 
uh, a kind of a timing solution, full reference design from Lattice. And that is available for, you know, like vendors to, uh, to kind of incorporate in their products. So that's uh, now we are moving forward and that's where uh, we are working and we have been discussing this uh, uh, a small cell where Lattice is actually, uh, you know, acting as a bridge, which is the PCI we are connecting to the modem. And that's where uh, we, the, the earlier work which we are doing with uh, great part, I mean, great uh, discussions which we are having with, uh, with the NXP. Uh, being a modem and then all the uh, RF trans receivers on the other side. So this lattice is actually coming directly into the user plane. We are we are providing this bridge user plane acceleration functionality from PC, connecting PCI uh, to the GSD, which is still happens to be the widely used standards in some of these uh, kind of a RAN infrastructure designs. And that's what we are doing. And um, uh, this design leverages, of course, low power of our FPGA and with higher service and logic cells. Uh, and uh, I think I talked about PCI, but it's a PCI Gen 3 uh, to connect that modem from NXP to the first choice of our uh, solution actually considers RF solution from ADI. But this is going to be a vendor agnostic uh, solution. Uh, to implement the small cells. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Suffice to say, from our point of view, from NXP side, um, uh, I'd say we we very much believe in an ecosystem play here. You know, the the ver variety of products that are coming to market means that there is no single fit on the hardware side, software side, RF side, antenna side. You know, the whole thing. Um, so uh, I think I, I very much echo, you know, the the statement of you know more players coming in there and jointly building uh, uh, an appropriate answer to each challenge. So so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, uh, panelists. This was a great discussion. Um, I have a few more questions to address to you, but we are running out of time. So thank you so much. Thank you, viewers, for your attention. I will take one question. So we have run out of time and. But I'm going to take one question, and then uh, rest of the questions we'll address through your contact information uh, over email. Wim, what trends would we see in 2024 MWC? Uh, quick one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what we're going to see, but I'll tell you what I would like to see. Um, I think given that last year we started seeing a lot of these ecosystem Know, boxes in a respectful way coming to market you know the i can now buy a small cell or medium-sized cell that works um where i'm hoping that we're going is demos that show these add-on uh, application capabilities so i would like to see a satellite hovering over barcelona i would like to see some very creative positioning based applications that mm -hmm. tell you which line at the coffee shop is going to be less than 45 minutes wait um, and, and everything that goes above it. Um, and you no, know, can't disclose what NXP is going to show, but I think you're, uh, you're more than welcome to drop by Manta and Ashish, both of you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, hopefully, we will be. Don't see what you guys have to offer. Yeah, we will ho hopefully be able to sh see some next generation solutions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, viewers, um, Thank you. for your Thank attention. You. Thank you, panelists. A pleasure to have you both on uh, this show and hope everybody enjoys Lattice's Developers Conference. By the way, we do have another session for the Oran stack. So please look it up and uh, you can watch the recording and uh, get to know Lattice's uh, Oran offerings um, also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.